Hi there, me, your friendly neighborhood, <clears throat> excuse me, humble stroke assaulter. So we're going to continue part three of the um, stroke caregiver uh, partner spouse um, self-care video. I'm going to do this in four parts. Um, the fourth part will be specifically about burnout. This one we're going to talk about resources. I've talked in the first two videos about some of the difficulties that um, you may have in a relationship after a stroke with a partner or a spouse. So I've mentioned some of that. So let's just talk about some of the resources that are available to you. In the description, if you go to the middle part of the description, I'm going to leave links to uh, stroke associations or stroke support organizations uh, from Canada, the US, Scotland, New Zealand, Australia, uh, the United Kingdom and then there's another one uh, to a world-based organization that will give you the opportunity to find support in your area I'm not a doctor I'm not licensed or accredited in any fashion I'm just a guy who's had a stroke who has access to the internet that's about that so let's just talk about the necessity of support groups for the caregivers the spouses, the partners, the husbands, the wives, the family members, the close friends of those that have had a stroke. Because a stroke, as I said before, is a very traumatic event, but it need not traumatize our relationships. So the hospitalization period for the first few months and then at home were the most difficult for 76% of caregivers. Now, this is an amalgamation of, of the documentation, which I'm going to leave again for the research links down below. Unmet needs that were related to caregiver preparation. Well, you can never really prepare for a stroke. I wasn't prepared for it, wasn't expecting it, didn't want it, it happened. Um, I was probably prepared better than most. Um, I say that one, because I was went to school to work in mental health. Uh, I had some education about brain injury. Uh, I worked in mental health. Some of the clients I worked with they were in an environment where they were there for other help, but they happened to have a brain injury. And then the last job I had in mental health was actually working with brain injured clients being what would be called a rehab and therapy support worker. So at that point, caregiver preparation, unfortunately, there's a lot of shock and awe when you've had a stroke. And it's not something you can effectively be prepared for. You know, can you be prepared for a car accident? Maybe. You know, maybe you've got some emergencies of supplies in the car. Maybe you've got your car insurance. You know, you, you've got all the phone numbers ready. Can you be prepared for traumatic car experience? Uh, that, that's, that's a horrific accident. Getting in a small fender bender where, you know, you get T-boned in an intersection and you need to get a rental and maybe you got a bit of a sprain. You know, you, you can kind of be prepared for that. Can you truly be prepared for the traumatic worst case scenario car accident no not really then you have the difficulty of the caregivers trying to pr promote the survivor's functionality right and i've heard some people say well that's just like tough love I'm like no it's not tough love works with specific individuals in specific situations uh, where you're dealing with personalities of conflict, personal, uh, you know, personalities in conflict, uh, co you know, uh, uh, so for example, you know, you're a teenager, you're a bit rebellious and your parents decide to put down their foot and lay down the law of the house and go, if you're not in the door by 1030 at night, I'm locking the door, right? First time you're home at 1031, the door is locked. That is tough love. Um, you can't you can't commit to a tough love strategy when someone has a brain injury because a stroke is a brain injury. You can't commit to hardline tactics in dealing with someone with a brain injury because I'll be honest, there are days where I get easily fatigued. And I can't control that. There are days where I get easily confused. And I can't control that. There are days where 
I get fatigued and confused. I can't control that. So tough love works in a scenario whereby the things you're asking the other person to do are in the realm of their control, such as show up, show up at home on time. Like you will be home before curfew or the door is locked. Well, I don't have a curfew. This isn't a matter of enforcing some arbitrary rule of a household. This is, you know, trying to get my brain to, to cooperate. Okay. Uh, you know, so the tough love theory doesn't work. Um, and there's not much you, you can do about that. So promoting their functionality, their function is, you know, motivating them on the days that they don't want to do things. Um, not pushing too hard on those days, because there's going to be days where it's not a case I don't psychologically want to do it. I just physically can't. My, my body and my brain, they're not, they're not playing along, right? Um, and the last one is sustaining themselves and the family. And, and that's the big piece. You have to sustain yourself, and then you have to sustain the family unit. The, the stroke survivor uh, is, is a portion of the family unit but they can't suck up all the resources. It's gonna feel like they do some days though, okay? And home healthcare, meaning like a nurse or a support worker coming in, apparently is only used by about 50% of the caregivers. Um, why is that? Could be a funding model thing. They don't have the money for it. It's not covered by insurance. Uh, it's not covered by uh, like a healthcare plan, it's not available in their area, right? Having someone come in and take care of someone who's elderly is one thing. Finding someone that's knowledgeable and competent with brain injury might be something totally different. Okay. Now, when we look at the predictors of poor stroke-related caregiver outcomes, <clears throat> that's scientific medical speak for when, when you and your relationship starts to suffer because of you spend more time taking care of the stroke survivor than yourself, right? Uh, those are emotional distress, low benefit appraisal, high task difficulty. Um, so high task difficulty, you're being asked to do something you might not have the skills or training to do. Right? Low benefit appraisal, you don't really see the benefit in a thing. So the doctors, the physiotherapists, the psychotherapists, the, the rehab team, the clinical team gives you some tasks to do. Uh, and either you as the caregiver don't see the value in it or the stroke survivor themselves doesn't see the value in it, right? So there's a lot of um, potential there for additional research, right? So... And as I've discussed before, there's not a lot of research out there for support groups or, or support um, necessities for the, 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 the partner, the spouse, the caregivers uh, of the stroke survivor. Family caregivers provide essential support because they're going to be the first line of support. They're going to be the person that wakes up with them every day, helps them out in the morning, helps them bathe, helps them toilet, helps them dress helps them get up and down stairs, um, helps make the decisions about what we're going to do that day or not do that day. Because I know, because um, I'm stubborn, uh, and sometimes too stubborn for my own good. I know there have been occasions where I've wanted to do things, and my girlfriend has explicitly said, no, you were not doing that. And... I have to accept that she's right because I know I'm stubborn and I know like, I'm going to go do this with you. She's like, no, you're staying at home. That'll just be too much for you. And, and I know, I know that it's difficult for both of us when she needs to put her foot down uh, because I know it's a bit of a role reversal. Um, it's a bit of it sort of changes the dynamic of the relationship. And that, that can be difficult because when that happens, I know she's doing it out of genuine care and concern, right? Um, and then usually when she gets home, we have the conversation, hey, are we okay? And we, no, no, we're fine. You <laughs> don't want to say this too loudly, but you are right. Um, so, you know, so there's a lot of role reversal 
there's a lot of I want to use the word parenting but I, it's not the right word and it's not just because of the anomia I can't find the right word but that's the word I'm going to use parenting there's a lot of parenting involved when you're dealing with a stroke survivor or a brain injured uh, family member because they're going to want to do things that might be sort of outside common sense for them to do at that point right and then there was a study out of Toronto that looked at we might need to make some changes to service delivery to better support caregivers that might include addressing caregivers changing needs across the continuum of care and as, as I said before there is no one linear uh, progression path or rehabilitation path for a stroke survivor or a brain injury patient it, it, it's just it's just gonna happen the way it does and unfortunately even me or I as the stroke survivor I have a difficult time getting the health care from my general practitioner that I need because he in my opinion has no clue what he's doing when it comes to stroke <laughs> from the experience I've had with this individual um, from the conversations I've had with this individual from my perceptions about his specific lack of knowledge he keeps going like well, when you go back to the neurologist and I'm like he discharged me from his clinic in October that's almost a year ago so the neurologist says neurologically there's nothing more he can do for me he discharged me I keep having to remind my GP that the neurologist discharged me because ne neurologically there's nothing that I can benefit from his resources so there's no need for me to use his resources he discharged me to the care of my primary care physician it's a bit of a numpty looking for a new one soon so if I'm having difficulty getting the resources I need a stroke survivors spouse caregiver family member husband wife whatever you choose to describe yourself as you're going to have difficulty getting the help the support you need right also implementing a family centered model of care not looking at just the person who's had the stroke but looking at husband wife children um, extended family in situations where multiple generations or multiple branches of the family tree live under one roof because again anyone that lives with that individual now becomes a caregiver in a manner of speaking right and then also providing seven day a week inpatient rehabilitation right? so being able to go to a rehab facility on a Sunday being able to go to a rehab facility on a Saturday being able to go to physiotherapy you know on off hours so instead of having to schedule all my appointments between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. why can't I go to rehab at 9 at 9 at night you know why can't I um, that would that would have been beneficial in many respects So some of the implications from the study out of Toronto are caregiver support needs change across that continuum. Support programs should be offered outside usual working hours. Healthcare practitioners should address the needs of the stroke survivor and their family caregivers. And caregiver benefits, the caregiver will benefit from receiving support from healthcare professionals, family, friends, and caregiving peers. Right? caregiving peers meaning other people that are supporting persons that have had a stroke a brain injury or even a, a long-standing illness because there's a lot of commonality there between supporting someone with a brain injury supporting someone that's had a stroke so supporting someone that's had say a spinal cord injury there's a lot of commonalities there the injury in and of itself is moot in some cases because you're dealing with some of the same situations some of the same dilemmas some of the same concerns so those are just some of the things that being the caregiver, the spouse, the husband, the wife, the family member, or even close friend of the stroke survivor, the brain injured patient, or someone who's suffering, uh, or, or not suffering, I hate that word, um, someone that's dealing with the implications and the complications of, of dealing with um, a long-term chronic illness or a, a long-term debilitating illness. Um, yeah, I implore you, reach out and get the support you need. Again, I'm going to leave the links for some organizations right so for example 
you're going to find the March of Dimes. You're going to find the Heart and Stroke in Canada. You're going to find some specific resources for the province of Ontario, mainly because I live in the province of Ontario. So I'm, I'm going to be a bit prejudicial toward the province of Ontario. Uh, you've got some links from the USA for the American Stroke Association, the United Kingdom from their Stroke Association, also an organization called Different Strokes, from Scotland, um, uh, the Chest, Heart and Stroke uh, uh, Association out of Scotland, from New Zealand, because I know I've got at least one person that watches me from New Zealand, and not to leave Australia out, you know, New Zealand's bigger brother, so I'm going to put in Australia, uh, didn't forget about you, New Zealand. I know you. I know you get left out on the maps, and I'm sorry. And then I've got another one for worldwide worldwide resources because I know I have <clears throat> viewers from Indonesia. I know I have viewers from Argentina, the Netherlands, and other places. And I, I can't proclaim to be an expert on what's available in your area. I can't proclaim to be knowledgeable of what's available in your area. I don't have that amount of time on the internet. Well, maybe I do, but it's it's going to take too long. But what I'm going to advise you is. <clears throat> Seek out resources from your local brain injury clinics. Uh, there may be other support groups from organizations that might be faith-based, be it your, from your church, your temple, your mosque, you know, whatever you happen to call your place of worship. You might be able to find uh, things out through your general practitioner. You might be able to find things out through your local library. There may be even resources at a nearby university or medical school that's offering some type of study or support group. So on that note, <clears throat> for those of you that are doing probably the most honorable thing ever and that being supporting those of us that have had a stroke or a brain injury or other long-term chronic illness you need to go and find the resources that help you take care of yourself so that way you're not going to end up dealing with what we're going to talk about in the fourth video <clears throat> burnout so please I'm going to leave all the links to the research I've done uh, down below. I'm going to leave the links to all the support groups in the middle of the body of the description. And if you happen to know someone who is supporting someone that, that is going through the rehabilitation and reintegration journey from a stroke or a brain injury, please point this video out to them. Point the channel out to them. Uh, they will get some benefit out of some of the content I generate. If you yourself are going through the throes of recovery from either a brain injury, a stroke, or even chronic illness, Please, subscribe to the channel or point the channel out to someone that is. Like, share, subscribe, leave your comments down below. And if you happen to see either in yourself or someone around you the signs and symptoms of a stroke, that being someone who appears to be immediately befuddled, confused, or has uh, lost their sense of balance, someone who has um, eye problems, vision issues, they, they see at a grayscale, they can't see to one eye, they only see a little dot in the world, they can't move their eyes in a certain direction, someone who has facial droop is a noticeable visual slackening of the facial muscles, someone who can't raise both arms equally effectively or at all, someone who can't smile equally effectively or at all, someone who has slurred, stuttering speech, inappropriate word usage for situation or context, someone who has the inability to stand unaided um, or has general body weakness or weakness on one side, please immediately place that person in a position of comfort and dial 911. Something so simple can save a life.